I'm doing this talk in response to an invitation to take part in a webinar about architectural conservation of temples in India. I think this might be a little bit late for the webinar, but it's goaded me into doing a little piece on a temple conservation project at Ashapuri in Madhya Pradesh. It's a site with dozens of beautiful temples from around the 9th to the 11th centuries. That is what we might call the Pratihara and Parmara periods in central India. And some of them are rather important for the history of architecture. Yet the site is very little known because it's only come to light over the last 20 years or so. It's unknown from any texts or inscriptions and we have no idea who built the temples nor of how the place fits into history more generally, other than the clues that we can see on the ground. Oh, and yes, the, the temples are completely ruined. I think the project might therefore have lessons for the many other temple sites in India where stone fragments of once splendid monuments lie scattered or laid out or piled up even at famous places like Kajraho and Konarak. Now, I'm not a conservation architect. I am an architect and I suppose an architectural historian. So while I shall say something about the conservation strategy we proposed for the site, I'm not going to presume to say anything heavy about the rights and wrongs of different conservation approaches. But I would like to talk about the relevance and use of architectural history in conservation, specifically the conservation of Indian temples and especially where the temples in question are broken into lots of little bits. By architectural history, I mean the kind that engages with actual buildings of the past as physical things and gets to understand the thinking through which they were designed and made. This kind of architectural history is not just helpful, but I would say essential for solving the jigsaw puzzle posed by the stones from ruined temples. And in working out those puzzles, we may find new pieces to add to the giant puzzle of architectural history. This is a medieval castle near where I used to live in Wales. On the right is a picture at the site showing what part of it probably looked like. It's a knowledgeable picture, but you can't be certain that it's correct and you certainly can't be sure where individual stones went in the building because the stones are plain and all much the same. Medieval temples in India are quite different, even if completely ruined and all in bits like a jigsaw puzzle. They are such structured designs that if enough pieces remain, it's possible to say precisely what they looked like and to show where the surviving fragments fitted within the design. There are, of course, examples where the Archaeological Survey of India have reassembled temples from available pieces of stone, filling in where necessary with plain stones. This is Hirahadgali. And this is Bateshara. But I want to leave aside for the moment the question of actual reconstruction of temples and focus on graphical reconstruction. How you can recover the design of a long lost temple from its surviving fragments. Ashapuri is about 35 kilometers from Bhopal in Madhya Pradesh. It's about six kilometres beyond Bhojpur. Bhojpur was chosen by the Parmara king Bhoja early in the 11th century as the site for his ambitious royal temple, which was never completed. It's a much more famous site than Ashapuri. But we know from Ashapuri's remains that that place must have been already an important cult centre and settlement long before the arrival of Bhoja on the scene. Bhoja created alongside his temple an enormous lake 
for irrigation. And it's funny to think that suddenly in the 11th century, Ashapuri must have become a lakeside town. Today, Ashapuri is a beautiful village, but only a little way beyond the urbanizing tentacles moving out from Bhopal. In the village is a small local museum. It contains sculptures from the various ruined temple sites in the vicinity, including, as you can see here, some Jain temples. And from this site, very close by, just outside the village, at a place called Bilota. When I first visited Ashapuri in 2001, I only went to the museum and to Bilota. But by piecing bits together, I was already excited to realise that here were the remains of a very early example, that is about the second half of the 10th century, of what was then the new Bhumija temple form. On the right, we have the famous Bhumija temple of the 11th century, the Udayeshvara at Udayapur. What I did miss on that first visit was this group of nearly 30 ruined temples beside a tank. It's a little way to the west of the village and is known as the Bhutanata or Bhutnat group after the local name of the biggest of the temples. This site is now under the protection of the Directorate of Archaeology, Archives and Museums, Government of Madhya Pradesh. I did visit it in 2007, when most of the temples looked something like this. Nobody knows for certain what caused the destruction, whether it was war or earthquake or natural dilapidation or a combination of all these things. By 2012, much of the site looked like this, because meanwhile, the department had numbered the mounds and the various temple bases, dismantled the mounds, cleaned the pieces, numbered them according to where they were found, roughly, and laid them all out on the hillside at the back of the site. It was like 20-something jigsaw puzzles with a lot of bits missing and quite a bit of jumbling up between the different puzzles. But the puzzle... <clears throat> but the puzzles are ones that can be done. So it was a fantastic opportunity when World Monuments Fund, in partnership with the government of Madhya Pradesh, chose the Bhutanath complex at Ashapuri as one of several sites in need of a, of a feasibility study for conservation. I became involved as part of the Welsh School of Architecture, Cardiff University. The project started in 2013 Cardiff's involvement was in partnership with the School of Planning and Architecture in Bhopal. In particular, I should mention my friend and colleague Vishaka Kaotekar, who led the project from their side and has been the real driving force. We worked in all kinds of weather, boiling heat and monsoon rains. We chose three of the temples as a sample for study. This is temple number 17. You can see that the base of the temple is surviving. The sub-base or pitta with its lotus moulding around the edge forms the floor slab of the temple. On top of the pitta stand the three beautiful mouldings of the Vedi Bandha. From right to left we see the staggered Bhadra, or central projection, the Pratibhadra, flanking the Bhadra, and the Karna, or the corner. Having the base of the temple intact is very helpful, even if it's a bit disrupted, because essentially it gives us the plan of the temple. Look at the scale from corner to corner, Karna to Karna, the exterior square of the sanctum is only about two metres. Now that we have the plan, we have at base level the widths of the main components, the Karna, the Pratibhadra and the Bhadra. 
They won't be exactly the same on the different sides, the, the three free sides, but give or take a few millimetres. These pieces have to fit on top of the widths of the base that we've already established. So we have to look in terms of size, of width, but also of style. We have to be sure that all the pieces we think belong to Temple 17 have the same feeling, the same style and belong together in the same temple. We'll soon get to know the height of the wall. It's a very small temple, so nearly all the pieces consist of a single slab forming the outer skin of the wall. And so on upwards. And finally, we see that we have a lovely little Latina temple. That is the single spire form of Nagara temple. I think this Temple 17 is the earliest surviving one at the site and must have been built a little before the middle of the 9th century. Stylistically, it's rather close to the Shiva temple at Terahi, shown here. How is all this done? It can't be done in a step-by-step -step linear kind of way. It's very important from the start to get an overall idea of the kind of temple we think it is. Here is a sketch done at the beginning so, so that everyone involved could get an idea of the kind of thing that we're looking for. With the collaboration of the Department of Archaeology and help in moving the stones around, the architecture and architectural conservation students working on the project, some of the time as part of their curriculum, took photographs flat on wherever possible of all the relevant fragments and added the key dimensions. And so we compiled a huge database of stone fragments, not just from the three sample temples. Because the puzzles are all muddled up, it wasn't possible to put all the pieces from each respective temple together in the database. Further sorting would be necessary. Even with this wonderful database, I found I wanted to go around the site making my own scrappy notes. In all of this, it's very useful to know the geometry of the Gavaksha or horseshoe arch motif and of the kit of parts that goes together in different combinations and permutations to make Gavaksha jalas or networks covering the pediments of niches and the segments of the shikara. Luckily, a lot of pieces still survive from the central lata. Back at home, with the help of the photos, the sketches and the dimensions, I sat down to puzzle it all out with the help of large bits of graph paper, a pencil and a rubber. And then inked it all in on a large bit of tracing paper, scanned it, and then fiddled around with Photoshop. Let me go through the other two sample temples more quickly. This is the base of the complex and luscious temple number five. These are the river goddesses Ganga and Yamuna from the jams of the beautiful temple doorway. And this is the ceiling from the porch, almost complete except for its central pendant. I've drawn a reflection of the ceiling on this plan. We'll see that it's uh, another Latina temple and it's subterrata, which means it has seven projections on each side. This is the little sketch I did at the beginning. I thought the temple was composite or anekandaka, 
with little shikaras at the base of each segment of the main shikara. I thought this because there were various pieces like these. But I was wrong. It turned out that the shikara is a single Latino unit. These little shikaras formed beautiful miniature temples over the niches of the bhadras, penetrating through the cornice or varandika up into the actual shikara of the temple. So the temple is not quite anekandaka, but is experimenting and is tending that way. Again, I scribbled on graph paper and then fiddled around with Photoshop. This must be early 10th century-ish. There's no other surviving example of this particular idea, just as there's no earlier Saptarata Latina temple surviving. By doing the puzzle of a single temple, we add to the bigger puzzle of the history of Indian temple architecture. One of the prominent features of the site is these four pillars with their beams, which once stood at the centre of a temple now numbered number 12. This must be of similar date to temple number 5, something around the beginning of the 10th century. It's an unusual form of hall temple with a continuous wall of pilasters. The four pillars stood at the centre. I'd never seen anything quite like this, but we later discovered this monument, which must be a little bit later in date, at Turban near Chanderi. For all the other temples at the site, we were able to work out the plan, even in some cases where there was no surviving temple base. The one on the left is a beautiful Chaturmukh or four-faced temple, numbered tw temple number 20, and on the right is temple number four. We could also get an idea of the general form of each temple from the surviving fragments and get a feeling for their style and character. I don't know if you can grasp the difference in style, very slight and subtle between the temple on the left and the temple on the right. That temple on the right, Temple 4, reflects a very widespread stylistic shift within the Nagara tradition across central and western India around the middle of the 10th century. It's very clear in the form of the Gavakshas, which transform from something like this to something like this, even more linear and with their ears on the side pushing further out. These are examples of their jala patterns. In central India, all of this belongs to what we refer to usually as the Pratihara period after the distantly ruling dynasty. Something very radical happened here in the Malwa region of central India around the end of the 10th century and the beginning of the 11th roughly corresponding to the arrival of the Parmara rulers in this region. In terms of Gavakshas and their Jalas, it's like this. The new current carries on alongside the continuing Nagara tradition. It's a transformation that runs through all the mouldings and details and betrays close contact with the Deccan. This transformation of stylistic detail accompanies the introduction of the new temple form called the Bhumija. And the exciting thing is that it's all happening here at Ashapuri. This piece is from the Bhutanata temple itself. This is the surviving base of the great Bhutanata temple. Connections with the Deccan can be seen in the plan, which is three kuta with three sanctums around a common mandapa. 
These remains are surely the earliest surviving ones from a Bhumija temple of such scale and ambition. It was clearly a Shiva temple. Look at the crispness of the carving, the superb sculpture and the play with star-shaped forms in the ceilings and door jams. The miniature Kuta Stambhas, shown on the left and right here, illustrate a conscious awareness of northern and southern Nagara and Dravida temple forms, important in the, in the creation of this new kind of temple. That same awareness of different regional forms is reminiscent of King Bhoja's architectural treatise, the Samarangana Sutradhara, compiled in this part of India around this time. The base of Temple 26 at Ashapuri, next to a living Hanuman temple outside the fenced compound of the site, exactly reflects the Malayavan type of Bhumija temple described in the Samarangana Sutradhara. When Raja Bhuj started his ambitious project at Bhujpur, it must have been from nearby Ashapuri that the masons mainly came. This is clear if we compare details of carving at Ashapuri, their quality and their character, with things at Bhujpur. Here I'm comparing some Ashapuri pieces with one of the engraved line drawings at the latter site. Since the Bhutanath temple was built on the edge of the tank, a lot of pieces had fallen down into the ghats and uh, needed to be recovered. So we conducted a salvage archaeology exercise in collaboration with the Department of Archaeology. And we discovered a lot of really interesting pieces. Having worked out the plans of all the temples and their stylistic characters, we can begin to reconstruct the plan and the development of the site as a whole. We can distinguish three phases according to the styles. Phase one in the Pratihara period is roughly early 9th to early 10th centuries. That big kind of hall thing at the bottom, Temple 13, may be a temple, may be a mutt or a monastery. That must have been near the entrance to the site from the village, or rather from the town as it would have been then. You can see Temple 20 with its four faces is a, is a sort of pivot to the site. The main group of temples, temples is built on a common platform. And then up to the right, Temples 10, 11, 12 uh, must have been on a route that goes up onto the hill into the forest to the Asha Devi Temple, the Goddess Temple, which, uh, the remains of which still survive with some ghoulish sculptures. Then phase two, still in the Pratihara period, is around the middle of the 10th century. And they're filling in the gaps on that platform. Look at how intimate and small scale the, the, the spaces are. And they're building out towards the tank. And then finally, in the late 10th and early 11th centuries, we get to the Bhumija temples of the Parmara period, early Parmara, we should say. The Bhutanath took pride of place, not on top of the hill to the south, but by muscling in on the edge of the ghats, possibly extending the ground out into the tank, which might have contributed to its eventual collapse. Whatever calamity befell the site can't have been that much later, maybe a century or so, uh, after the completion of the Bhutanath temple. There is evidence that local cults continued to worship at the site, probably amongst the semi-ruins. The name Bhutanath, of course, Lord of the Ghosts, 
is likely to be a more recent one. And now something about our conclusions and recommendations. In the conservation strategy we presented to WMF and MP government, we ma imagined the Boutenat complex brought increasingly into relationship with the other archaeological sites around Ashapuri and beyond, not forgetting Bhujpur, of course, as these two sites really do need to be understood together. We envisioned planting with indigenous species of trees and bushes to recover something of the original forested setting. And as part of the landscape, we proposed a series of platforms or terraces on the rocky slope running up behind the Boutenard complex. Something of this kind was, and still is, urgently needed to save the stone fragments from further degra degradation on the ground, where they suffer from damp, the extremes of weather, accidental knocks, vandalism and rampant vegetation. Shelters could be built along the platforms, but the priority was to get the pieces off the ground. We felt that this kind of platform would simul simul We felt that this kind of platform would simultaneously serve two other important purposes. Firstly, they would allow research to continue through the progressive sorting out and matching together of the fragments of the respective temples, continuing to solve the jigsaw puzzles we've begun. During this process, pieces that belong together would be put together, and all of this would feed a third purpose, that of meaningful display. Visitors to the site, instead of acres of carved stones lying on the ground, would begin to understand the different temples and the temple architecture to which the stones belong. Where possible, fragments would gradually be reinstated in the temple remains from where they came, initially in the surviving temple bases, once these have been duly stabilised and consolidated. In due course, temples would be reassembled, partly or wholly, and meanwhile a visitor could make sense of the material belonging to them, helped, of course, by suitable explanation. Which, sh which should be as visual as possible to account for different languages and degrees of literacy. Ashapuri could be a unique museum, an open air museum of temple architecture. It would exhibit the beauty of carved stones seen close up and reveal things about construction and carving that you can't appreciate when they're high up in a temple tower. Let's return briefly to our sample temples and the question of actual reconstruction. Let's think about how graphical reconstruction may relate to actual reconstruction. These drawings show indicatively how many stone pieces from the exterior of Temple 17 are available in relation to ones that are lost. Lost stones are indicated by red in the picture. To reassemble this temple, you would not have to provide too many new stones. How would we treat the new material? Take this part of Temple 17. The stones would have looked like this when in their blocked out state before the detail was carved in situ. So it would be generally accepted good practice to replace the lost stones with shaped but plain ones, like this, so that people can distinguish the original parts from the new ones. This practice is quite familiar from ASI sites such as Kajarahu, and we would not argue with the approach. Often it looks a bit weird when they've tried to do the carving in detail. A temple like Temple 17 has three sides essentially identical, so knowing where a piece fits in the elevation design 
does not tell you which side the stone actually belonged to. Before reconstructing, there would therefore have to be one further stage, a trial assembly on the ground of sections of the temple to see which stones actually fit together. I feel this temple really should be re-erected rather than leaving the stones on the ground to deteriorate further. Of course, the masonry is dry without mortar, so reconstruction is in any case reversible in the future. Here at Temple 17, bottom right near my foot, we see the typical trace of an iron clamp. Today we can use stainless steel, which doesn't corrode. A temple like Temple 5 is a different matter. Again, in this drawing, the red represents the missing pieces, and you can see that while we can reconstruct the design, to reconstruct the actual temple re would require more new stones than old ones. Here are two sketches imagining how you might do a meaningful display of the fragments from Temple Number 5. Here's an example of how you might explain about how things fitted together. This is showing the Vedi Banda and its components. And here you show which bit went where. And then you arrange the pieces with plain blocks in between so that they have their original relationship. There are so many temple sites in India with stone puzzles like the ones at Ashapuri, either entirely in pieces or with stone fragments stacked or lying around. I hope that this talk may be of some use in showing how graphical reconstruction of temples is possible as a necessary step towards actual reassembly or for the arrangement of fragments into meaningful displays so that people can understand how the parts fit into the whole. Meanwhile, I visited Ashapuri again last December 2019, and it was again looking like this. A small visitor centre is being set up, but the pieces of temple, apart from the bits of sculpture being put in the, in the museum for safekeeping, are still on the ground, fast losing that crispness that they had when first exposed. That freshness that makes them seem as if they'd been carved yesterday. Making something of this site must not be for an elitist promotion of heritage. I think of somewhere like Daulatabad Fort and the sense of relaxation and fun for local people on outings from Aurangabad. And I think of Gangaram and the rest of the gang at Ashapuri, whose home it is, and who worked as labourers on our project, and how they grasped it all and searched out lots of key pieces of temples, and, the, and of their pride in the place, and their hopes for what its neglected treasures can bring to it. I hope I have shown in this talk that to realise the potential of such a place, architectural history done with an architectural eye can be important for architectural conservation. Maybe there could be digital ways of doing the same job, but I'm a bit sceptical. So my advice to conservationists is get looking, get drawing, and learn whatever kind of architecture it is you're dealing with. Thank you.